Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers here in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth edition in our virtual series, State to State German-American State Legislator Dialogue. We at the ACG are very, very pleased to continue the partnership with the Aspen Institute Germany. Um, it is great to see you, Stormy. Thanks to you and your team for helping us jointly put this together. Um, this series, for those of you that don't know about it, was actually launched during the pandemic. And at Aspen and the ACG, we found that it provides a very important platform for real in-depth discussion at the subnational level and for the exchange of ideas between German and American state legislators and a broader audience on common challenges for states and communities on both sides of the Atlantic. Both of our organizations have a long track record of working at the state and local level, and we've recognized the increasing role of subnational actors on the global stage. Both Aspen and the ACG firmly believe in the importance of creating a fora uh, to engage decision make makers and opinion leaders at the state and local level to talk um, very openly about what their communities are facing. And I, for one, am very much looking forward to today's discussion about structural change and opportunities for renewal. This is a critical issue impacting communities in both of our countries. And I'll admit, I'm, I'm particularly interested in today's exchange because we have representatives from North Rhine-Westphalia and from Pennsylvania. Not only are these sister states, but this year, the state of North Rhine-Westphalia launched its NRW USA year as a way to recognize its close ties to the United States. And on a personal note, having lived in and worked in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I've participated in a number of discussions about structural change and what one could learn from the Ruhrgebiet and what maybe the Ruhrgebiet could learn from Southwestern Pennsylvania. So with that, um, I for one am looking forward to, to listening to you today and, and maybe weighing in with a question or two, but I am delighted to turn things over to Stormy Annika Mildna, um, she is the director of the Aspen Institute Germany, and uh, Stormy Miltner will uh, moderate today's discussion. So with that, Stormy, it's over to you, and, uh, and have a great exchange. Thank you so very much, Steve, um, for the kind introduction and also for already framing our dialogue in such an excellent way. Um, we are always um, also very dis um, excited um, to cooperate with you and uh, your team, um, selecting the issues and also putting together the exchanges um, and, and events. And as uh, you already mentioned, today we want to zoom in a little bit more um, and pun intended, uh, intended since we are using Zoom here, um, on the issue of uh, structural change and um, what that means for our communities, both in Germany and the United States. Structural change has many different phases and comes in very different versions. Um, and it, is, it has also different um, causes. Um, one big cause is um, climate change and the energy transition, but technological developments are also a big, big factor leading to structural change. Um, thinking about digitalization, but also artificial intelligence is likely to change a lot how we work, how we live, how we um, move, how we transport things and so on. Um, and there are many other factors which lead to changes in our economies, in the way um, we live, in the way we teach, in the way we educate, um, and also in the skill set we need um, to be successful in this, uh, in this new world. And this poses huge challenges um, and also opportunities um, to all those who have to make the decisions. Um, it poses big challenges to the legislators um, who have to set and decide about, um, about the legislative, the legal framework and the rules. Um, it poses big challenges to the business community um, and also to civil society um, and uh, schools, and not least also to us um, on, on a daily basis. Um, and to 
turn the challenges into opportunities, we really have to learn from each other, um, as Steve already mentioned. And this is what we want to do today. Um, and um, I'm delighted that we have three wonderful, wonderful speakers here today. Before I'm going to introduce them, um, I um, want to already prepare our participants um, that this is also a format which should be engaging and interactive. Um, so don't just listen in, um, but also get prepared to jump in later on by asking questions either in the chat function, so you can write them down, um, or you can also, sorry, in the Q&A function, um, or you could also raise your electronic hand um, and then I would call on you. Um, we won't have a visual, but we will be able to hear you. Um, so please join in um, in the discussion um, later on. So now let me introduce um, our speakers to you. On the German side, let me welcome Wiebke Brems, um, who is the chair of the Green Party in the State Parliament of North Rhine-Westphalia, North Rhine-Westfalen. Wiebke, thank you so much uh, for being here today. And Wiebke, you are joining us um, from your uh, from your office. Yes, I am. I'm currently at the state parliament here in Düsseldorf. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's really great. Thank you. Thank you so much. From the United States, we are joined by Senator Dave Argel, who is a Republican in the Pennsylvania State Senate. And Steve, where are you currently? Uh, Dave, sorry, where, Dave, where are you currently? I'm here at the uh, the State Capitol building in Harrisburg. Thank you so much for joining uh, us. And last but not least, I also want to uh, welcome Romina Plonska, who is a member of the Christian Democratic Union, CDU, also in the State Parliament of North Rhine-Westphalia. And Romina, where are you currently sitting? I'm in the uh, Kreishaus of rhein erf -Kreis. Uh, It's in Bergheim, uh, close to uh, Cologne. It's so nice to have all three of you virtually um, with us. And I want to start out um, with a question, with the same question to all of you, all three of you. Um, you are living and working in states which have undergone tremendous structural change. Um, which had been managed, um, and it was not easy to do so. Um, and I would like you to ask, uh, to, to tell us a little bit about your experience, um, what that structural change looked like um, in your state, um, and what was your personal exposure um, to this structural change. And if I may, I would like to start with you, Dave. Um, maybe you could kick us off. I'd be happy to. Uh, in addition to my work in the legislature, I sometimes teach some college students, and I was in the small town of Tamaqua in the district that I represent, which was an old anthracite coal mining and railroad center, and we were talking about all the problems, and one of my younger college students said, well, you know, what the hell went wrong here? Why do we have so many of these problems? And I had to explain that his grandparents and his great-grandparents probably worked in a coal mine, but most of those jobs, not all, but most of those jobs began to vanish about 1950. And when my father was at Tamaqua High School, uh, one out of every four individuals looking for work could not find it. So tens of thousands of people moved away. Uh, that left behind uh, some serious poverty, some blight. We have a lot of abandoned houses in some of the, the communities that I represent. And, and I, I note all this because in, in chatting with my German friends, I know that they too, for a whole different set of reasons, had some similar uh, issues in, in Germany in the 1950s, but they too have begun to recover. And so when I see the kind of recovery in both West and East Germany, uh, it gives me hope. And so I think there is a lot that we can learn from each other. Thank you so much, um, Dave. And we come back to this um, in a second and dig a little bit deeper into what uh, structural change means and what is currently happening also. Um, Romina, how does it look in Nordrhein-Westfalen? 
Yeah, I'm a, a member of the parliament of a district um, with a um, yeah, big part uh, of coal mining, brown uh, coal. We have uh, here in Bergheim um, a power plant um, with brown coal and um, yeah, a big coal mine. And uh, we decide from uh, politicians um, that we um, yeah, will skip uh, the brown coal until the year of 2030. And now we have the yeah, challenge um, to uh, get new energy, uh, renewable energy um, for our um, yeah, companies, uh, factories, and for the people. And um, yeah, we want to create new jobs in uh, in future businesses like uh, artificial artificial intelligence or digitalization, but also for the yeah for the miners. So it's a big challenge, and um, polit politicians have to um, create the framework for good jobs. Thank you so much. Um, and over to you, Vitka. Yeah, uh, so uh, my topic is also the coal phase out. And I'm a member of uh, the state parliament since 2010. Um, uh, previously, I worked as an electrical engineer. And so for me, um, yeah, it was always to, to work on the phase out of coal and going into renewable energies. That's why I, where I'm coming from. So um, as Northern Westphalia is a coal mining country, um, so we have this big uh, transitions, one which uh, already, um, I wouldn't say it's complete, but it, um, we, we phased out coal mining there. Uh, so the, the deep uh, mines uh, there for, for hard coal. So um, we stopped that in 2018. So that was a big transition, which started just, but uh, yeah, decades ago. Um, but uh, so that's one part. And the other part is that we just uh, decided one year ago to phase out the coal mining, uh, which Romina explained, um, until 2030. So that's a short period of time. And it's for me, it's very interesting and good to, to be here at this point because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working for this coal phase out since my first day here um, in Parliament. So that's very uh, exciting and very good uh, to be part of it now. Thank you so much uh, to all three of you for kicking us off um, and sharing some of your experiences with us. Um, so maybe we stay a little bit with the topic of climate change, energy transition and structural change and what that means before we also um, touch upon the issue of new technologies and digitalization and maybe also um, on the issue of um, education and, and skills. So on the German side, um, the as, as we just learned from Wiebke and Romina, um, the transition or the structural change, in a sense, it's also a decision which was made by um, legislators based on what their stakeholders and also what the population wanted. But it is not the only reason why there is this change, right? There are also economic reasons for this. And maybe you could go a little bit deeper into why we have made this decision in Germany to do this in part, at least in the short term, painful structural change to maybe get to something else. But you can tell us a little bit more about this. Maybe Wiebke first and then Romina. Yeah, I can start with that because um, we have to really uh, look at these two different parts of coal mining in Northern Westphalia. So um, the part um, of the hard coal in the Ruhr area, um, that um, was a decision also made by, by the European Union. And uh, so because of um, uh, because of how, yeah, uh, how expensive it was to dig so deep uh, in North Australia, they said that the uh, the, um, the the money given uh, to these companies by the federal and the state uh, level um, should come to an end because of European laws for um, competition. 
So, um, and it even took us longer than you, the European U Union wanted. So that was a, a decision, just a financial decision. Um, and the second one um, in the area where Romina is from, that is a decision because of climate change. Um, and uh, so that's two different um, topics. And the one uh, because of climate change is one where we have to, to work on to, to get uh, in the same uh, time uh, the renewable energies on board more because um, the, the lignite coal, coal um, we cannot import. So it has so much water in it. So uh, it will really, we will phase out the um, the burning of coal for electricity as well, um, and um, the the hard coal is imported uh, at the moment. So we have these two different parts, um, and yeah, that was one of the decisions. We all we always knew that uh, at the latest in 2045, the coal mining areas would end. So we um, made first a decision on the on the federal level to um, make it earlier until 2038. And then one year ago, there was a uh, um, uh, negotiation between uh, Northern Westphalia, the uh, state level, and the company who is working in the area. And um, to make this de decision to say, OK, we, we phase out uh, this coal until 2030. And then um, to, to work on renewable energies at the same time, to work on uh, gas um, power plants, for example, who will be um, able to burn uh, hydrogen later on. Um, so that was one part of these ne negotiations. Thank you so much. And over to uh, Romina. So with the decision uh, to stop uh, coal mining in North Rhine Westphalia, um, it's uh, the biggest uh, individual individual uh, measure of um, yeah, CO2 um, savings. Um, so it's um, for the uh, climate change, a big, big um, um, measurement uh, here. We, um, we do in North Rhine Westphalia, we are still on the way to stop uh, or to phase out the coal mining. And on the, on the other hand, um, the federal government um, and the um, government of North, North Rhine Westphalia support uh, the region um, uh, with, uh, um, with the consequences of this um, uh, coal, uh, stopping coal mining. So with um, money and um, yeah, with uh, new places for factories or um, businesses, um, they support the region. Um, that yeah, we will have workers and we will have a good nature in future. So maybe this is an addition to people's very good description. Thank you so much, uh, Romina. Now, Dave, on the US side um, in, in Pennsylvania, there isn't something comparable to what we just heard, like a decision to phase out coal, is there? No, uh, our decision was mostly market-driven uh, in, in the 1950s and the 1940s after the war uh, with increased supply of, of oil and, and natural gas with the fracking then uh, coming on in Pennsylvania in the 1990s, many of those, uh, they weren't just more convenient, uh, it, was, it was less expensive. And so many of our power plants began to transition uh, I, I told you I, I became a grandfather on, on Sunday, and when I explained to my new granddaughter someday that in the 1960s, I used to haul coal uh, from the coal bin uh, 10 or 15 feet to the furnace in buckets, she's going to look at me like a dinosaur because, you know, today it's so much easier just to reach on the wall and, and adjust the, uh, the, the thermostat. But we should note that uh, you know it, it continues to change. It continues to evolve. Uh, when I was in Dusseldorf with with the Aspen Group, uh, one of our more interesting translation uh, challenges was in talking about hard coal and soft coal uh, in uh, the part of Pennsylvania that I represent. It's the really, really, really hard coal, the anthracite. We call the bituminous soft coal, and we don't have lignite, uh, but uh, for 
our supplies recently, uh, the demand has doubled and we now have more people working in the anthracite mines than we did a few years ago because before the invasion of Ukraine, Russian anthracite uh, subsidized cheap Russian anthracite was competing with Pennsylvania anthracite. That's no longer uh, the case. And so I guess all that I would encourage anyone who's paying attention to this issue is to stay tuned to current events because sometimes things change uh, in a very, very rapid way. Mm. And some sometimes they come from within a state and sometimes it's also international developments yes. um, and changes also in the geopolitical and geoeconomic environment. Um, and you mentioned Russia, but China might be another player, um, which is inducing some structural change um, in some of our countries. Dave, you said earlier on um, that one of your students one time asked, so why did so much go wrong um, <laughs> in the transition? And maybe we can um, now talk a little bit about what are the, um, well, what are the factors which contribute to a successful transformation of regional economies? Um, and what are also the experience, or what are policies we should definitely not repeat um, in transition periods? Dave, maybe you can share a little bit of uh, your experience with yeah. us. I had some graduate school professors who used to like to explain politics with a math equation up on the board. And I always would politely note that there are people within that equation and, and that can change everything. Uh, people sometimes work together. Sometimes they argue and argue and, and refuse to cooperate and refuse to uh, compromise. Uh, when uh, our German friends were together, Uh, we sometimes joke that, you know, we have two political parties in Pennsylvania and we have trouble getting anything done. Uh, Pennsylvania people in politics can't begin to understand how you can get anything done with six different uh, political parties. And so people are, are an important factor. Uh, they are very resistant to change. I think that's, that's international. Uh, but we have seen some success stories. I was able to show you some success stories when you came to visit in, in my district in Schuylkill and in, in Carbon County. The other thing that's important is government policy. Uh, we talked uh, a little bit about some innovative tax policies, which have really begun to help some of those Pennsylvania communities which had fallen behind that uh, with the transition uh, suddenly Their, their population was down, their tax base was down. And so uh, government isn't the total solution, but it sometimes can help. Mm -hmm. um, and Dave, um, when um, we visited you um, in your district and you showed us um, different, um, different uh, good cases, um, we also learned that there's a big cultural component um, around it. Um, people are proud of what they are doing. It's their livelihood. They have been doing that in the past. Um, they hope to do this in the future, but it's really much more than just a job. It is very much a, well, culture, really. So what? how do you manage this? If there needs to be structural change, because looking in the, into the future, it just needs to be done because of economic reasons or climate reasons or whatever, it needs to be done. How do you take away, though, this cultural component and exchange it with something else? Step by step by step, but uh, incrementally, don't try to do it all at once. Uh, when we had some of our first visioning community meetings in my, my hometown, we, we brought in a lot of facts and figures because not everyone is well aware of, of everything that's going on in the community. Some people didn't realize that the population had declined or that the tax base had been so negatively impacted. And so we had to prove to people that the status quo was unacceptable. And that if we didn't begin to make some pretty detailed plans for the future, uh, towns like mine could have been left behind. Mm -hmm. And this is, you go to your people, to your district, um, you talk to them, you show them the data, you bring in experts, or how does this work? Yeah, uh, all of those things. And uh, it, again, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. 
Uh, we we uh, began by solving some small problems to build up trust. And then after that, people begin to trust you with some of the longer scale, the, the larger problems. So, um, Romina, what would you say are um, the factors which contribute to successful transformation? So we learned uh, with the structural change in the rural area that universities um, play a big role uh, in a successful structural change because when they um, yeah, innovate things and you have a, a good connection uh, to the local or international economy, um, you can use uh, these as drivers uh, for uh, transformation and um, to create new and um, yeah jobs which which have a future. So uh, we try in my area um, with uh, real laboratories. I don't, I'm not sure if that's an uh, English word. We call it in German real labore, uh, where um, yeah companies um, can work very close with um, researcher. And um, so yeah, we hope um, this will a good driver for the structural change. Um, as I uh, told. Um, We have a big uh, project with artificial intelligence where we um, connect all the people um, in the um, in this business and um, yeah, hopefully there are some uh, startups which um, yeah were born or will be born uh, from these uh, connections. And uh, Romina, what uh, what do you uh, the government do um, to increase acceptance for all those? big changes which are currently taking place at the same time. Yeah, it's a bit uh, like Dave um, uh, told us before. It's um, a, a lot of work uh, to talk to people, especially the workers um, in the mining company, uh, to explain um, why, is it, why it is necessary for the climate um, to, um, yeah, to stop uh, coal mining in North Westphalia. And um, yeah, that's a hard discussions because um, there are other countries in the world um, who, who build new power plants uh, based on uh, coal mining. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's um, our task uh, and uh, yeah, for our kids um, that we will have a good future with a yeah. Um, um, world uh, which is um, not so um, yeah interrupted by the climate change so um, it's um, yeah it's a big deal and a big discussion and uh, many people helped uh, like the um, like the Gewerkschaften the unions um, and um, yeah but uh, it's a lot of work still a lot of work still a lot to do And over to you, Vika. Yeah, I would add two things. Um, so I would just add another dimension. So, but Umina also uh, talked about artificial artificial intelligence, and I would to to broaden it to digitalization because the area where I'm coming from, we don't have that much. We don't have coal, but we have a lot of um, family-owned uh, companies um, who had to always adjust to, to the market, to changes, because some of them, for example, are coming from old electrical companies who are working, uh, who are making electrical appliances, for example. And um, these uh, companies are competitors and they um, work together to make innovation. So normally they would just do it on their own and say, okay, um, I don't work with my competitor to, to work on new things, but um, uh, they work together. And that's why the region where I'm coming from is still so strong, um, so economical strong, where other areas struggle a little bit at the moment. And uh, I think that's very special to work together on solutions. And they, they work together until a certain point and then they say, okay, now we do our special things with that in our own companies. Um, and um, from the um, legislative side, so we, uh, at first, uh, these companies had this idea to work together and we um, supported that with money, for example, but 
uh, now they are nearly working on, on their own. Um, and I think that's a very good thing to, to adopt to other areas. And uh, the second thing, I think, yeah, it's really, really important to work on citizen participation um, because um, as uh, Dave and Romina just said, um, it's, but it's very, it's very hard to work on it because it's easier um, to, yeah, to uh, exploit fears who are there because uh, the transition is, is change and change I think people don't like to, we don't like change, yeah? So, um, and um, I think it's our um, our important work to, to explain it. And it's always easier for certain political movements to just exploit these fears um, than to just work together and um, yeah, to, to let the people um, see what the change also can be uh, and that it can be good and change um, uh, and, and bring good changes for them. But that's a really hard work for, for everybody in the political area. Mm. So, Wiebke, if we don't manage uh, structural change in a good way, it could go also terribly wrong uh, for social cohesion and also for the stability of democracies, right? Absolutely. And um, in Germany, uh, not in our area, but in the eastern part of Germany, they know a lot of about changes. So we had uh, the fall of the wall. And then after that, in the early 90s, a change where a lot of um, the companies yeah, were kind of sold out or um, um, were moved to the West. And so um, a lot of uh, the people um, there uh, learned that change is not good for them. So, and now we say the political, the politicians say, okay, we need, need another change. And so that's how they. I can understand that they, they just stand back and say, oh no, another thing. And um, I think it's not. Um, um, I think that's one part um, of the explanation why in these areas a lot of the right right wing uh, party um, is is uh, getting stronger and um, I think that's really really um, because they're an extremist party that's really dangerous for democracy in the, that area and it's really hard to work that backwards so we know in our area we have to to work on it from the beginning Mm. And Dave, would you say and that that is also? Oh, sorry, Romina, please. Sorry, <laughs> maybe I will add just a one point that um, you have to talk with the workers um, in in a way that their work was good work. That they don't think they are the bad people who um, do the climate change. So um, this is a special, um, yeah, talking to the workers. That was the addition. Thank you so very much. Um, and Dave, um, do, is there also a risk um, or is that something we are already seeing in the United States that um, uh, difficult structural changes lead to, um, to less social cohesion and also to some threats to democracy? Uh, of, of course. When, when I was studying politics in Pennsylvania in the 1970s, all of the experts said, you know, aim for the middle that uh, if you go too far to the right or you go too far to the left, um, that, that isn't where, where the voters are. Now it would appear that we have more voters uh, in the United States on the right, on the left, not so many in the middle. And in a, a case like Pennsylvania, um, we have to work the middle or we get nothing done. Uh, we have a Republican majority in the Senate uh, we have a tie in the House, likely to go back to the Democrats after a special election. We have a Democratic governor for the next three years. And so sometimes compromise can be very, very unpopular. But if you don't make at least some compromises, you get absolutely nothing done. And so that that is a challenge for us every day. 
Thank you so much um, for also underlining um, what could be could go terribly wrong if we don't uh, manage social change in, in a good way, in a sustainable and future oriented way. I now wanted to come to a different um, topic, and it's so wonderful that um, one of our uh, participants um, jumped in with a question, which is just right on the next topic I wanted to raise. Um, and Adam Philip is um, uh, is posing a question um, to you. Dave, but I think it is also a question to Wiebke and Romina. And um, he asked about um, best practices for revitalizing our downtowns and older industrial neighborhoods. I mean, this is a big question because we are talking about larger areas, industrial areas. Um, we are talking about huge coal mining fields. And what do we do with them when we are done with that industry? Um, so maybe you can, and, and there are already some good Good examples on both sides of the Atlantic and in both of your states. Um, so maybe uh, Romina and Wiebke, could you share some uh, best practices with us? And then over to Dave again. So yeah, I will start uh, um, uh, with the with the example we have um, in the rural area, big um, old industrial places, um, which. Um, are re, re, re revitalized. Re revitalized. Um, <laughs> hard word. <laughs> yeah, it's it's even in German uh, a hard work. So sorry for this for my English. Um, uh, with uh, state money, so um, that um, you can use it um, as factories uh, as well. If they are cont contaminated or something, they are revitalized. So that's the word again, uh, and they are used <laughs> again as a factory um, factory place. Or we have um, in in my um, district um, uh, a use um, where an old um, yeah rubbish um, place is, and you uh, can't use it anymore um, with uh, farmers. Uh, so they built. Um, like a farmer's um, so strawberry fields on um, uh, on a highway, so like a um, I don't know how it's called, like a regal. Um, um, so they are um, not uh, the, the strawberry um, plants are not on the floor. They are a big made a bit higher or plant a bit higher, so they are not in touch with the contaminated. Um, uh, floor, but uh, the field is also used, and um, the farmer now um, uh, thinking about um, renewable energies on this place uh, with uh, solar panels. So that's maybe two or three examples um, where you can use old factory sites. Thank you so much, Vika. Yeah, I uh, what I learned uh, from from our exchange uh, with the American state legislators was that I I had the impression that um, despite which German party we came from, we all uh, uh, focused on re reusing these um, old. Uh, factory sites or something like that because we don't have so much space like the Americans um, and uh, I think that's why uh, this is stronger in Germany but it's all sometimes it's not going on I think uh, fast enough yeah so uh, these reclaiming uh, takes sometimes decades and uh, I think that's one of the problems we're working on I would uh, suggest another Thing we also uh, visited here because it's not only this reusing uh, what uh, Romina talked about, but uh, where we have in Essen this old coal mining area where uh, which is now used in different parts. So it's used as cultural um, area um, and as well as industrial uh, site. So uh, I think that's one of the the big. Um, examples uh but which yeah uh, co cost a, a lot of money um as we know um and i think um that um if, as i just had a look at the question again i think i have the impression that in germany we um 
some of the the people are saying that we are, we focus too much on the uh, the urban uh, issues and not so much on the on the rural uh, issues. So uh, we have I think we have a bit different discussion than the um, than probably in Pennsylvania. So I'm looking forward for, to Dave uh, uh, answers. <laughs> yeah, me too, Dave. Over to you. <laughs> when we had our group to the district, thanks to the Aspen Foundation, I promised to show the legislators from the United States and Germany the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, we saw the ugly. We saw the, the terribly contaminated uh, stream, which is the result of so many years of coal mining that we are trying to make better, and it's better than it used to be, but we still have problems. Uh, we also, I think, so showed them some things we were very, very proud of. We have a waste coal industry, which is removing huge mountains, which have littered the landscape for 50 or 60 or 70 years, and using that uh, to make electricity today. And that won't last for 100 years, uh, but uh, the mountains are disappearing. And I think we would all agree that's a good thing. We also showed you uh, the small town of Jim Thorpe, which was dying when I was in high school and has now reinvented itself by essentially opening itself up to tourists from, from all over the, the country. Uh, people come there to go whitewater rafting down the Lehigh River. Uh, they take bicycle trips up in the mountains. They love exploring the old historic uh, downtown because one of the good things about economic decline was no one changed anything. And so all we had to do, all, it wasn't easy. Uh, people had to come in and fix up the buildings and fix the roof and, and maybe uh, do some carpentry work. But, but today, Jim Thorpe has a new problem. Where do all of these thousands of people find to park their cars? And so I always tell people it's a problem, but it's a better problem than, than economic decline. And, and as several of you have indicated, uh, reusing what used to be here. Uh, next week, we're going to celebrate uh, the 20th anniversary of a new community college in my hometown. It's the site where my father went to high school, uh, graduated in 1953. It's now a community college. And that community college is the result of a little bit of state money, but a lot of money from the private sector. Uh, private foundations came together. And today, anyone from my hometown uh, can go there when they graduate from high school for two years for free. And I know low cost higher education maybe doesn't sound like a uh, a radical idea in Germany. It's a very radical idea in in the United States. And so uh, I think those those are some of the things that uh, that we have focused on to to make that difficult transition. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much. Um, uh, Dave, Wiebke and Romina mentioned that exchange a few times which they participated in. I should have mentioned that in the beginning. Um, this is uh, the Aspen Institute's Labs of Democracy, where we bring together state legislators from both sides of the Atlantic for a whole year working on one specific topic. Um, and all three of you have uh, participated in this year on structural change. Last year, we did um, energy transition and climate change. And the year before, um, we did digitalization. And I know, um, Steve, that you also have a wonderful initiative with such study tours um, on social cohesion. And maybe you could just quickly jump in before we continue our discussion here and tell us what that is. Sure. Um, so, you know, the, the American Council on Germany also has a long tradition of uh, immersive exchange programs. And um, in recent years, we've actually been focusing very heavily on the state and local level by bringing people together to talk about a couple of different issues, many of which have already come up in the course of this conversation. Um, one of the topics has been sustainable urban development. And Vipka, to your point, very often, you know, the focus is on cities rather than on, on rural areas. And so maybe one of the things for all of us to be thinking about is how we can work more with rural areas. Uh, both Aspen and the ACG have also been been doing a fair amount of work with farmers um, and cattle ranchers also in recent years. So we've, we're trying to cover both bases. But through our study tours, we've also focused on topics like digitalization and the future of work, 
workforce preparedness, um, but also this key issue of, of social cohesion and how the fabric of society in our communities is changing and how we have to prepare ourselves for that. Um, so obviously many of these topics are interrelated and, and very, very connected. But if I might, I'd actually like to, to pose a, a somewhat different question to the panelists. Um, you know, listening to you speak and listening to you talk about the different actors that are involved. Um, Dave, you were talking about the fact that, that policymakers are faced with challenges of their own and, and can't necessarily um, find all the solutions by themselves. Romina, you were talking a little bit about the role of trade unions um, in, in some of these issues. And I'm curious to hear from each of you what kind of, of sort of institutional partnerships there might be um, that bring together government, business, trade unions, civil society to um, really try to address some of the challenges that you've been talking about when it comes to structural change, right? Part of it is, what are you doing on the ground? How are you creating new infrastructure? How are you creating new opportunities as you're dealing with the breaking away of, of old industrial structures? But the other part that each of you has sort of touched on in an interesting way is, how do you change the mind of your citizens so that they can embrace this structural change as well? So I'd be, be just very curious to hear a little bit about what kind of partners each of you as, as politicians have in trying to make the case and implement some of these changes? Thank you so much, Steve, for jumping in. Um, and um, I see Romina reaching for the um, unmute button, so go first. <laughs> So um, we have uh, like an institution um, which is called um, Zukunftsagentur Rheinisches Revier. So um, my area is uh, the Rheinische Revier. Um, that's a name like the Ruhr area. And um, we have uh, like an agency uh, which um, um, all parts of the society are um, a member of this agency, like the unions, um, the um, majors or some majors of um, the cities uh, which are very um, um, yeah attacked um, by the structural change or by the uh, facing out the coal mining we have um, um, the um, nature um, nature organizations um, and we have some members of the parliament um, um also which yeah come together and discuss what the best way to um make a great future for our region so um it's a good place because there are so different um views of the structural change um maybe one example are the unions and the um um and uh, nature um, organizations um the nature organizations want to um, a good um, landscape um, for for uh, animals, insects, or all that, um, yeah, small um, things like uh, plants. And the um, unions want uh, new jobs, and to discuss it on on one table is um, maybe one good way um, to to yeah have a great future for all um, interests and um, stakeholders. I would add something, if it's okay, um, uh, just really in addition, so I totally agreed with Romina, um, what I think in the areas, um, one of the big challenges is to get all the mayors on board um, and to work together. And because in Germany, we have this saying where um, um, you always think um, on, on on your own church tower yeah so just, you just as a mayor you just have your own church tower your own uh, area um uh, in focus because there's that's where you get re-elected or not um but uh, as this whole area changes you can get uh, a um a new factory in every 
small uh, town. So um, it um, it's very important to have an organization to work together so um, that you can work on it, that every town has different uh, uh, positive opportunities. Piece, uh, with it so I think that's one of the big challenges we, we are facing um, uh, facing in in this area and um, yeah to get the people on board I think uh, yeah it's really work to yeah sometimes it's really to work on face to face to it so but I think um, also the the whole picture the whole discussion um, needs to be there as I just have a look back uh, I just I, at the beginning I said I am in the in parliament since 2010 and in that time when we the green party talked about coal phase out all the other parties say what are they talking about we don't talk about that so and now um we we did it together uh with a, a party Romina is part of so it's kind of a um 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 in a change um who took place um outside because um we talked about a lot of uh climate change and uh a lot of people really experienced that climate change and so they knew okay we have to we have to do something um and uh then you have to work on it um on the ground really yeah to work uh, to talk with with nearly everybody and that's one of one part of it one of the most rewarding efforts that i've seen here in the small towns that that i represent back home was we invited everyone all of the mayors all of the borough council all of the township supervisors pennsylvania has a lot of local governments it's not just Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. It's a lot of small towns. And what we learned was some of these people had never even met each other, even though they were in adjoining towns, except once in a while when they were arguing in a lawsuit at the court. Well, we thought maybe they should meet outside of the courtroom. And within weeks, they were planning uh, new biking trails, a uh, new industry for the local uh, community, uh, a better downtown. Um, recreation. Uh, I had a, an old leader of my own party scream at me on the telephone because she thought I was talking about annexation when one town actually could take over the next town. I was talking about soccer. I was talking about foosball. I wasn't talking about annexation. But again, we worked on some small projects together. We built trust and you saw some of the results when we, we took that old 1874 train station and a million dollars later, it's now the, the pride of the community. Uh, but you, sometimes you have to start small. Thank you very much. I just want to remind our um, participants, our audience, that this is also the time for you really, really to come in and don't be shy about it. Um, because if you keep on waiting, then we won't be able to answer all your questions. Um, so please do so and, and join us in. Um, I've been sent um, a question via email by somebody who couldn't use um, the Q&A function. Um, and that person wanted to know um, a little bit about the upcoming structural change uh, with regard to digitalization. Um, and she asked if we are prepared well enough or if we are running into a huge problem because the skill sets we are going to need in the future are going to be so absolutely different um, than um, what we had in the past. Um, and uh, what would you say, um, Dave? Are we already thinking enough about this? Are we prepared enough? And one of the things I learned on our exchange was that the shortage of skilled workers isn't just an American problem. I, you know, I, I heard it. And I guess the one thing for sure about change is that there will be more of it. Uh, here, we're now talking about the fact that with increased uh, broadband, and we still need to work on that, we have some big mountains where I live, and that makes the, the geography uh, and the technology a bit challenging. No, people don't have to move away to live in a big city anymore to, to work in a career in, in journalism. 
or communications. I'm trying to convince my daughter to come home rather than live by Washington. And I think she's willing, but her her new husband is from Southern Arizona by the Mexican border. He doesn't like Pennsylvania weather. So maybe the technology there isn't good enough. But no, there are certainly many, many more opportunities uh, than there would have been in the past. And there will continue to be new opportunities because tomorrow the technology will change again. Mm -hmm. um, I would add that uh, I think one problem I see is uh, that the administration is historically grown over the last hundreds of years or <laughs> decades. And I think um, that they, uh, at the moment, they um, are not fast and flexible enough to uh, respond to this dynamics, um, to this reality of digitalization and automation. So um, in Germany, we are um, talking about uh, a lot about um, uh, data security, I think that's a word. Um, and um, uh, for example, to, to uh, give over the um, all the paperwork um, you need, for example, for 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 windmill. So at the moment uh, that you, you, you really have to get a kind of a truck to, to bring all the paperwork needed to get um, uh, the uh, um, um, the allowance to to build a, a windmill, for example, and in in Northern Spalia, only one administration is able to uh, where you can upload all the data. One out of all the three hundred and sixty administrations there are. So I think that's one of the problems we are talking about because we have sometimes we have we have good and high standards, but um, sometimes the uh, the administration things. Uh, it's it's done like that the last years and decades, so it's working good. But I think that's one of the problems we are facing um, at the moment, and it's it's a really big, uh, um, yeah, big point to to change administration um, uh, to 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 work with that. Oh, thank you so much for raising this issue. Um, I think a lot of people like to hear um, or like to know that there is work on a digitalization of administration uh, of administrative services um, to reduce um, the time it takes to get permits, but also on a personal basis to get your passport renewed and many other things, you know. So I think there's lots to learn and lots to do, Romina. So um, because I'm here in the uh, Kreis House, it's a um, yeah, local um, state uh, level um, between the land of Northern Westphalia and all the cities. Um, we have 10 cities and now it's uh, possible to, um, um, yeah, to say I have a new car um, by um, not coming here anymore. So um, they digital um, the procedure of, um, yeah, um, of uh, car admission, is it uh, admission? I'm not sure. Um, so um, we we try it uh, step by step, at, as uh, Dave said uh, said before. Uh, but it's a long way, and um, yeah, for all the trends, um, for all structural change, it's important um, to take the people with you. And I think um, for digital digitalization. Uh, there's a big fear of um, many people um, who are not used to it. And um, I think this aspect, um, yeah, has to be said. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you mean the uh, registration of cars. Um, and yes. That can be also <laughs> digitalized and uh, would reduce a lot of time for individuals, but also for but also for those people who are working within administrations. And that time could be maybe used on some other more uh, other things which are more necessary could be more efficient and better used uh, time. Um, Dave, how advanced is your administration, your state with regard to digital services? It, during the COVID shutdown, uh, when many of the state offices had to work remotely, I think we were all very surprised to see the world did not end 
the uh, services uh, were continued to be provided. I was surprised one day uh, when I was over visiting the Secretary of Revenue, who's the state's tax collector, and I said, where is everyone? And he said, oh, it's Monday. Uh, people can work from home. Now, that doesn't always work. Uh, you can understand there's still some distrust. Will people really work as hard when they're home with their dog as they would if they were sitting next to their colleagues in the office? I'm sure we will continue to, to adapt. Uh, but in some ways, we were forced into this uh, experiment. And uh, I think we found that people, many people like working from home, and I suspect we will probably see uh, more of it in the future. And now I want to turn to two questions from our participants uh, written in the, in the Q&A. The first one is by Astrid Schmidt-King. And um, she asked, in thinking about post-industrial cities and their structural changes over the decades, how might recent renewed interest in industrial policy be an opportunity for these post-industrial areas? And we do see lots of legislations um, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, we in the European Union have our Green Deal um, and a lot of money being um being invested um, and in the United States, we have the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, is that all a good, is, is this all an opportunity or are there also some risks? What would you say? Who wants to start? Dave, do you want to start? All good or also some risks? Uh, anytime there's change, there is risk. Uh, we weren't able to, to take you to Allentown, which is famous because of the old Billy Joel song about sitting here in Allentown and they're shutting all the factories down. Uh, they went through a, a tremendous change, uh, but because of uh, the private sector, because of some, I think, very innovative uh, tax policy, uh, Allentown again has a, a thriving downtown. Now, the education system still has challenges. There are still uh, concerns about poverty and crime, uh, but we now have people returning to the old industrial areas uh, to live again with, with new apartments. They can walk down the street to the hockey arena. Uh, there, there are new restaurants. And so there's much more vitality than there would have been 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And so I guess what I would say to anyone is, you know, don't give up. Don't give up on Pittsburgh. Don't give up on Dusseldorf. Don't give up on, on little Tamaqua. Uh, those, uh, those changes uh, can come, they can be positive, uh, but it takes time and it's not easy. And sometimes it's not cheap. Uh, it does take investment. What's your thoughts on this, Vivke? I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I get the, uh, the question right. So, <laughs> um, um, but well, you know, you just or if you have something, but <laughs> I would jump in. Yes, I I will help uh, from the German side. So I think it's um, uh, on both um, um, yeah acts you mentioned are good and bad things uh, or um, chain uh, challenges and opportunities. Like um, we have um, in Germany big challenges um, with the price of energy. So we have high prices and we are discussing at the moment um, that we will um, reduce the energy price for big industries. Um, um, so on the one side and on the other side, um, we have this Inflation Reduction Act and um, um, many peop uh, many companies um, tell us um, here we have um, um, a price uh, which is um, more more cheap or cheaper than um, you um, can can offer us um, in in Germany. So we will go to the United States. So uh, for for uh, to have my German uh, glasses on, um, the Inflation Reduction Act is, is not helping us um, to uh, transform uh, our industry. And um, yeah, on the other side, we have this Green Deal, and we have the opportunity to. Uh, spend many public money in the trans, um, transition of economies um, like the steel industry uh, on our trip. We uh, visited uh, ThyssenKrupp um, and uh, ThyssenKrupp will um, uh, or get many, many public money to transform uh, the steel um, 
um, still pro process uh, in, in a green way. Um, and um, so, yeah, there are always, like always in, in the life, um, opportunities and challenges. And um, uh, if we want to do something for the clim climate and, and, and reducing the climate change, um, we need um, public money um, like we can do with the uh, Green Deal of the European Union. Yeah, and I would like to add that um, we need this public money because we need to get the change done quicker. So I think um, the the transition towards um, more climate friendly um, processes would we are already uh, seeing that in very different areas. But as we say, we need to do it in a, a much more quicker way. That's why we need this money, the public money to say, okay, if you have to invest now, you need to have this, um, to, to be sure that it lasts. Um, that's the one thing. And to get it done, uh, you need this money. So that's the, th the two things we need to do um, as le legislation. And I would like uh, to add that we have uh, um, that the um, the government of um, Northern Westphalia, we uh, decided that we want to be the first climate neutral industry region in Europe. So that's that's a big thing. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we we want um, that the industry stays here and that it can change. So we have this big part in, in North Australia, we were talking a lot of coal, but a lot of people, they don't know that we're also big on, on the chemical industry. Um, and uh, that's um, really also very important to, um, to work on it, that the chemical industry stays here and can change into climate neutrality as well, because they are dependent on um, on carbon as well. Um, so we have another topic uh, on top of it, uh, what we already discussed. Mm. There's so many different layers and it's not just um, the national uh, challenge, it also um, it is a challenge how to do that and manage that internationally because what we do with the Green Deal has an implication for the United States. What we do with our carbon um, border adjustment mechanism has an effect on the United States and the other way around. The IIA, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, has an impact on us and some is good and some is also bad. Um, and so working together in the transatlantic relationship is just so important. There is one last question by Vladimir Grad before I hand over to, um, to Steve. And I know that you have been waiting so patiently, Steve, to jump in again. Um, so Vladimir is, is um, asking a question to you, mostly to Dave. Um, and I'm just going to read it to you. What are the type of challenges U.S. state legislators face while trying to implement initiatives in order to revitalize and diversify the economy in the West Belt regions, ensuring job creation, infrastructure improvement, and social cohesion? What is the silver bullet, Dave? Wow, I, I wish there was a silver bullet. I've been looking for 30 years and I, I haven't found it yet. Uh, I think it takes the private sector and the public sector uh, working together. Uh, it's it's not cheap. Uh, it does take money. I I am not a big believer in you know government trying to to do it all. I think uh, we need to till, still in, encourage uh, public private partnerships because as I I showed my German friends when they they came to the office here. I mean we've seen tremendous change. Uh, this is a picture of my my great grandfather working in the coal mines, and this is the pink slip. Uh, in American slang, a pink slip is the notice you get when you get fired. Uh, this was the day that he lost his job more than a, a hundred years ago in, in the coal mines. And so that kind of change is painful. Uh, but the town where he grew up looks better today than it did uh, then. And so I, I, I do not despair. I have seen German communities move ahead. I have seen American communities move ahead. It can be done. 
Thank you so much for these heartening words. And over to you, um, Steve. Thanks, thanks, Stormy. And, and maybe this is a way as, as you know, we start to run out of time and, and bring things to a close to, to be a little bit more forward looking as well. Um, you know, I, I really want to thank all three of you for these for these great insights and for sharing, you know, some of the challenges, but really also some of the opportunities of structural change. It was interesting living in Pittsburgh, you know, that that city describes its periods of renaissance very, very carefully, right? These are a positive development, um, despite the difficulties that are embedded in the, the kind of structural change and job loss that's bound to happen. But I want to come back to something that, that Romina was saying earlier about how do you bring people with you, right? How do you build that local support? And think a little bit about the next generation. Because when I was working in Pittsburgh and dealing with a lot of high school students, um, they didn't really have the imagination for what they could do professionally, right? They thought about what their parents did. Their dad worked in a steel mine or, uh, sorry, in a, coal, in a coal mine or in a steel mill. Um, their mother was a nurse. And that's what they thought the world of opportunity was. Particularly now, in light of the conversation that you've been having about digitalization, about the realities of new technologies, how do we combine workforce preparedness and the youth, right? How do we train young people today for the jobs that will exist the day after tomorrow um, as we go through this structural change process, which doesn't happen overnight? Um, Dave, people like your grandfather, who um, was a miner, he couldn't be trained in short order to take on a new job in the new economy, right? So we're gonna see some job losses, but how do we make sure that regions like each of yours are prepared for the future and actually have skilled labor to fill the jobs that we'll need in the future? I know that's kind of a big question, but I'd like to come back to, to education and youth and how we bring them along and, and what we do for them. One of the things that we have done is we've encouraged both teachers and students to get out of the school and go to see what is available. Uh, we had teachers that did not know that there were new high technology jobs on the other side of the mountain. And so sometimes we live in our own little silos and educators don't talk to business people and business people don't talk to government we need to break down those silos because uh, there are frequently opportunities there, but they just may not know about it. They need to go out and see it because chances are mom and dad and grandma don't know about it either. Um, I think uh, we are at the, at the point where we, we don't have enough workforce, so we don't have it. Point. So uh, we are talking all the way, all, all the time. So we need to to get what, some of these um, jobs be more uh, attractive uh, or something like that. We we need to do that, yes. But unfortunately, that will just shift them from one part to another part. So um, and um, so we don't have enough teachers. We don't have enough uh, who are working in kindergarten, and we don't have enough people to in, in crafts to do all the work we have to do. We need to do to to make the electrical change to towards renewable energy. So we need immigration, and we need um, that. Um, one one problem we have in Germany, we have immigrants and we have asylum seekers, but asylum seekers, they, they are not allowed to work. And um, and one of the problems is that um, how to, to, I don't know if it's the right word, but to acknowledge that what, what they know and what uh, their, their job um uh, knowledge and to to um, that they they are, that they are allowed to work in Germany. So that's not the only solution, but it's one big part of the solution we we need. And I think uh, automation and uh, artificial intelligence will have a big impact on that as well. Yeah, 
Yeah, and so, and um, to address uh, the young uh, people, um, I think it's important that um, we we address um, uh, with the future questions um, the young people. Like uh, when when I'm looking on my area, is um, how do you want the landscape to look like? Um, what is important for for your future? Or for future for the future of younger young families, um, what what do they need? Um, and um, yeah, this is um, a part um, of the discussion of the structural change, where we address especially young people to um, make sure that they are um, yeah in uh, in the process and that they can uh, create ideas about their future. And with this, unfortunately, Steve, I think we are at the end of our discussion round. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think that's right. But this is, I mean, the hour and 15 minutes has passed incredibly quickly. And I want to to thank all three of you, all four of you for this, this great conversation, incredibly insightful. Um, you know, I've certainly learned a lot and I'm, I'm hopeful that our viewers did as well. Uh, but let me turn it over to you, Stormy, to, to say the last words. Oh, well, um, first of all, many, many thanks to uh, Wiebke, Romina, and also to Dave. And um, maybe I've seen that Katja posted a report um, in the chat function. These are the recommendations which have been developed by the state legislators of our Labs of Democracy. And it's really, um, it's, a, it's, it's a consensus presented, um, it was hard work, and that's why I'm advertising it with all the energy I have, because it's um, it's really worth a read. Um, and they worked so hard on it. Um, and a lot of ideas we heard today are found in this report. Um, and um, with this, um, thank you very, very much. A big, big thank you, as always, um, to our cooperation partner, to Steve um, and your team, and also to my team for putting us this, uh, all of this together. And Steve, this was not the last time we are doing this dialogue, right? There's one already coming up. That's right. That um, That is absolutely right. I have to look at my calendar, actually, to see what the date of the next one is. Um, but we will definitely let everybody know what is coming up next. And we're very excited about keeping the partnership going. Yeah, that's a wonderful cliffhanger. So stay tuned. Uh, the, the, the sequel is going to continue. Exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs> for, to all of you and also to our participants and for your insightful questions. And we hope to see you soon again. Take care. So Bye.